standing as we go to God in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we come before you, Lord, in your presence with singing. Lord, we want to come before you in honor and glory of who you are and give you the proper praise and adoration that you deserve, oh God. Lord, you've been so good to us this week. Lord, you've blessed us beyond measure. Lord, there are blessings that we won't even know about until we get to heaven. So God, I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness to your people. I thank you for even the trials that you've put us through, Lord, because it brought us out stronger than we went in, oh God. Lord, I pray that we come searching for you this morning, that our hearts are open to the reading of your word, that we're ready to hear what you have for us, apply it to our lives, that we want to just seek to honor you, Lord, and just do your will. Lord, I pray for our Sunday school hour now, that you come down, you meet with us, Lord, that your hand be upon the service, Bless the pastor as he comes with the, the lesson. And I pray, Lord, that we take it in, O oh God, and that we use it um, throughout our week. We thank you for all you do. We thank you for being God to us and for your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. At this time, we dismiss the teen boys and teen girls Sunday school classes. Teen boys, teen girls, you are dismissed at this time. As they make their way out, we'll continue here in the adult Sunday school class by turning in an um, uh, to our Bibles, starting with our books of the Bible. We want to continue to learn the books so we can find our way easy through God's Word. So we're going to start in the Old Testament and go all the way through the New. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Job, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation. All right. Now we move on to a new memory verse, which is taken from Matthew 19 and verse 24. Matthew 19 and verse 24. 
we will repeat it twice after me, and then we'll see if anyone has uh, added Matthew 1924 to memory. So repeat after me. I want you to find it in your King James Bible. Matthew 1924. Matthew 1924. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man, oh, that, sorry, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Matthew 19.24. Say one more time. Matthew 19.24. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Matthew 19.24. Who thinks they have Matthew 19? Pastor? Amen. Monique. Amen. That's two. Any more for Matthew nineteen twenty four? Matthew nineteen twenty four. Alex. To go through the eye of a needle. Through. But close, very close. Anyone else? Matthew 19.24. Miss Alice. Amen. Winter. I think so. Say, do for a rich man part. I think you got it overall. So say amen. Right. Uh, Steve, so that's four. Amen. Five. Uh, Jamar. Amen. Six. Any other? Matthew 19, 24. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Matthew 19, 24. Amen? Seven. Seven. <clears throat> yes, Miss Addy. To go through the eye of a needle. I think you missed through. You said it? Okay. Good. All right. Amen. Eight. Anyone else? Alex. Amen. Nine. I was thinking we said of God, but I, I'm going to say that you would say that. So, okay. Nine. Nine. 
Anyone else? Yes, Ms. Glover. Very close. And again, I say, he said, again, I tell. Again, I say unto you, it is easier. See, close, real close. Miss Westbrook. Miss Westbrook. Man, 10. Going once. Yes, Justine. Man. Uh, Eleven. Winter. Amen. I think I come to you, though. So, amen. Eleven. But thanks for clearing it up for us a little bit. JC. Started with and? Did you say and in the beginning? Yeah. Okay. Amen. 12. Miss Sharon. Amen. 13. Any others? We'll be learning Matthew 19 24 all month. So if you don't get it this week, we're looking for you next week. All right, Julian. And for a rich man, for a rich man, close, for a rich man. Let's continue to study this verse. We will be hitting it every week throughout the month of September. So let us come ready next week in Sunday school to continue saying Matthew 19, 24. Amen? Amen. All right. At this time, we'll ask our ushers to come forward as they make their way forward. We'll ask that, JC, can you bless the offering?
Now let's continue our Sunday school hour. At this time, we'll like to remember the missionaries that are out on uh, the battlefield trying to win the loss to the Lord. So I'll ask if Brother Cornelius, can you pray for the missionaries for us this morning? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for another day of life you've given us. Lord, thank you for letting us come here today, Lord, to worship you. Lord, I pray for Chicago preachers, Lord. Um, preachers in Chicago, Lord, um, this wicked city. Lord, I pray for preachers that know your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that... Um, we're not out on the streets, Lord, preaching. Pray that they didn't know your word. If, if they were to be asked the question, Lord, they can answer it, Lord. You said in your word, Lord, to be quick to give an answer, Lord. Um, Lord, be knowledgeable, Lord, and be understanding, Lord. I pray that they will look to your word, Lord, to learn more about your word. Lord, I pray for preachers that aren't prideful, Lord, that... They don't go off their self, Lord. And they, they don't. They don't just preach, Lord, um, just to get the accolades or the attention. But Lord, I pray that they're doing it to Lord, to reach souls, Lord, for you, to change somebody's direction to where their eternal life is, Lord, or their eternal death, Lord. Lord, I pray that you. You give us more preachers, Lord, that are concerned about the souls of Chicago. Lord, I pray that you'll give us preachers that um, want to turn, Lord, want to turn them around, Lord. I pray that you help Pastor Lewis. I pray that you give him the wisdom to preach what you want him to preach, Lord, to spread out the gospel, Lord, whatever you want him to say, Lord. I pray that you'll give him wisdom. I pray that we open up our hearts to, his pre to the preaching of your word today. Pray that we will just stay faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. On most Sundays, we count the number of Sunday school class. And if you have a copy of the Word of God, we'd like to get a count. And if your spouse is somewhere else in the building, um, raise a hand for them. And then in a moment, if you would like to borrow a Bible uh, for church today, we will get you a loaner copy of the scriptures. Twenty-three. And then does anyone need to borrow a copy? You need one right here. And then if you read your Bible every day last week, we like to keep tally of that as well. If you read your Bible every day last week. Accountability is good. The Bible says exhorting one another and so much the more. Let me exhort you to take time each and every day for prayer and for the word of God. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. 
get the new look from God's word. The inward look, the outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's word. I still enjoy that song these years later. We're going to sing it one more time, but this time I want to hear you a little bit louder. Move your lips. Uh, it's Sunday morning. Let's uh, rejoice in the Lord and sing praises to him. Amen. And um, if it's a new song to you, you just try to learn it as best you can. But those of us that know it, let's really sing it out. Ready? Get the new look. From, hold on, stop, stop, stop. I have to say something before we sing it the second time. I started the book of Amos today, and I was reading through chapter 1, and I saw a truth that I had never seen before. And I said to myself, how many times have I read the book of Amos? I've never seen this. And now as we're singing this song, it's reminding me, that's what I want, the new look. I want something fresh from God's word every day. And if that's not happening, something's wrong. Get the new look from the old book. Ready? Sing it out. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's word. The inward look, the outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's word. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 9. Matthew, chapter 9. We're going to continue in a long study on the life of Christ, the life of Christ. We've covered the incarnation, the childhood, the temptation of Christ, and now we're looking at the miracles of the Lord, the miracles of Christ, and we are continuing with a particular miracle, the miracle of the healing of two blind men. And about 33 of Christ's miracles recorded in the Bible will comprise this study on the miracles of our Lord. And it's a good study. Studying the life of Jesus is a good study. No life ever lived like that life. Uh, no sacrifice greater and it is so enriching to slow down and to go through these accounts that if we're not careful, we just fly through and never really extract and glean and gain and harness truth that we can apply starting today. And that's what I want to do for my life, for my family. I want to follow him. Jesus said, follow him. I can't do that if I don't know much about him. And so join us every Sunday morning uh, as we study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 9, the healing of two blind men. We'll read verses 27 through 31. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 27. The Bible says, And when Jesus departed thence, Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. As we continue with this miracle, we'd like to pause and stop for a moment and consider what the Bible is telling us is the condition for the cure. What was the condition for the cure? In other words, what was Jesus looking for? 
In other words, what had to be present if this was going to happen? And for that, I want you to zero in on verse number 29, where the master said this, according to your faith, be it unto you. A very similar statement was spoken by Christ when he healed the centurion's servant. In that case, Jesus said, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. In both cases, the condition for the miracle was faith. And I want to draw an application that if we want to see miracles in 2022 in your life, if you want to see miracles in your life, the condition is the same. According to your faith, be it unto you. How big are your miracles? That's simple. How big is your faith? And faith isn't a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart. It's not a sentimental thing. We're so emotional. Faith is taking God at his word and obeying him regardless of the consequences. And I'm here to tell you, if you have that kind of faith, you're going to see miracles in your life. According to your faith be it unto you. Kind of puts the ball back in our court, doesn't it? We go to the Lord and we say, I have got to see you right here. Maybe it's a financial need or a physical need. I don't, I don't know, a spiritual need, an emotional need. God, I need you right here. And he puts the ball right back in our court and says, okay, according to your faith, be it unto you. And then we say, Lord, why did you work so little? I worked according to your faith. Very, very powerful truth. Christ inquired about the faith of these two men. Do you believe I can heal you? That's basically the question that was asked. And they answered that, yes, we do believe you can do this. So the healing takes place according to their faith. What was their faith? That he could do it. What happened? He did it. How did he do it? According to their faith. Faith opens the door for divine blessing. Sometimes that blessing comes in waves. Sometimes it's not in waves, but it's just what's needed. But it comes in accordance to our faith. Faith opens the door. And a lack of faith closes the door. Do you see how important faith is? The lack of faith that we bring closes the door. Where faith is great, the Lord will do a great work. Where faith is small, the Lord won't do a great work. Where faith is weak, Christ will do little. You say, how can you say that? He said it. The Bible says that he did little works. He, he could not do many mighty works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. The mightiest work that God can do for anyone here today is to save your soul. To save your soul from hell. And unbelief will prevent that. I'm afraid that people get saved or come to the Lord for a variety of reasons that are all the wrong reasons. I've heard of people coming to the Lord. They've had a big financial problem. They come to the Lord for salvation. But they didn't come to be saved from their sin or to be saved from hell. They came because they needed to get out of a bind. And we wonder why so many of those people are out the door not too long hence. Could it be that they had the wrong motivation for coming to the Lord? Salvation is to save a soul from burning in the lake of fire after death. And you come to be saved from your sins. Now he'll take care of the other stuff in your life. He's interested in that. But first your soul needs to be saved. You need to be born again. And unbelief prevents that. Question. Question. 
Is there anyone here today that feels as though they're short on divine blessings? Does your relationship with the Lord in some way seem unproductive or unfruitful? If so, if that's you, the answer is your faith. The, the answer isn't you trying to look like something that you're not. The answer isn't in talk, talking spiritual. I'm, I'm so tired of hearing Christians talk. You say, what do you mean? I want to see what they're going to do. Yep. No, it's not your talk. It's not your look. But if you're short on divine blessings, it's faith. And if you don't have strong faith this morning, you can change those matters. You can do something about that, praise the Lord. You say, how do I do it? Easy. Get your heart and your head into the Bible. Because the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If there's a disconnect in your life if you say, I just don't feel it, whatever that means. The problem is with you and the Bible. That's where the disconnect is, and that's where the disconnect will stay. You don't jack yourself up spiritually. It cannot be done. You don't pep, rap, pep, pep rally yourself up spiritually. It doesn't work that way. People try to do that with the entertainment that they throw at people in church. They just try to entertain them and jack them up and send them out the door. But you know that wears off pretty quick. It's like the sugar high. Eat a bunch of sugar and you get all energetic and then what happens? No, no, we need the Bible. And we need lots of it in good order. And not just at church, you need it at home. And so you need to be getting up in the morning every day and reading your Bible and praying so that you can have the right faith and in turn so that you can see God work in a greater way in your life. Open up the Bible and read. These blind men were glad that it wasn't finances that it took to heal their sight. These blind men, I'm sure, were glad that it wasn't fame that it took to heal their sight. There's no indication in Scripture that these men were famous or that they had lots of money, but they had one thing that the Lord was looking for. They had faith. If you don't have faith, and you, if you don't have fame, and you don't have money, but you have faith, that's all you need. He can work. Healing is not based on the things of the world. These men had faith. And that's the condition for their cure, and that's the condition for your cure. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're born again, that you're a child of God, that you're saved, the condition for your healing is the same as these men. The condition is faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. Faith not in yourself, but faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. Let's make that real straight, who Jesus is, the Son of God. Not just a good teacher. Not just a good philosopher. Let's get that straight. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is the Son of God. And you get saved by putting your faith and trust in what he did on the cross. And you accept the free gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. No crucifixes in our church. There's a cross, but you can see that it's empty. And that's on purpose. You go into a Catholic church, and he's still on the cross. And what we're saying is, no, he's not. Up from the grave, he arose three days later. We have a resurrected Savior, and we remember that every Sunday morning. The condition for the cure was their faith. Let's move on. The character of the cure. What was the character of the cure? You'll find that in verse number 30. What was the character of the cure? Anybody. In other words, what happened? Jamari. That's it. The character of the cure is that their eyes were opened, open. Now, you understand that that's symbolic, right? That that's a metaphor. In other words, if their physical eyes were open before the healing, they were blind, okay? 
blind people, if they open what's there, they're, they're still blind. So when the Bible says their eyes were open, the Bible is talking here about their sight, their blindness. Okay, that's the figure. Sight was now their precious possession. And I also want to be clear that this happened. I want to be clear that the miracles of the Lord are not just um, symbolic lessons. We're not just saying that this is uh, um, allegorical language. This happened. We believe in the miracles. We believe in a miracle working Lord who walked on this earth and went about doing good. And I have to say that because there's a generation of preachers today that want to explain away the miracles and, and maybe give some scientific spin on how it could have happened and, and wasn't really a miracle. And so you have Moses parting the Reed Sea, which at that time was about waist high, and people could wade through it and get to the other side, and it really wasn't a miracle. Then how did Pharaoh's army drown? I believe in miracles. I've seen them. Oh, I believe in them. And this is a miracle. This happened. He opened their eyes. They were able to see. But this is, I do believe, a real story teaching a real spiritual truth of someone's spiritual eyes being opened. The eyes of their understanding. Many people see no value in the Bible today. Many people have no understanding of the Bible. Many people don't value the Bible because they don't understand the Bible. Why don't they understand the Bible? Because their eyes are still closed. Their eyes have not been opened. And until a person comes to Christ, they will have closed eyes, unable to really understand the Word of God. But it is amazing when you get saved how the Bible becomes an unlocked book and an unlocked treasure. The Bible says in Luke 24, 45, on the road to Emmaus, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. He opened the eyes of these disciples after the resurrection. The psalmist prayed along these lines when he said, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things. Out of thy law. I want the Bible to become more of an open book to you people. And the condition for that is faith. He'll open the eyes of your understanding and you'll understand more and more truth. Moving on in this miracle, there's a restriction given in verse number 30. And we need to examine this restriction. This restriction was given to these men after they got their sight. He restricted their ability to publish what had taken place. In verse number 30, these words Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. Christ ordered these men to keep silent about the miracle, <clears throat> which almost I don't know if your mind thinks the way I do when you read the Bible, but I do want to think when I'm reading. That seems to be the opposite of the command to preach the gospel to every creature. In other words, the Great Commission was to go tell everybody in every nation. But right here, Jesus is saying, see that no man know it. Keep quiet about the healing. Why would the Lord do that? Why would the Lord do that? J.C. thinks he has the answer. And so he gave them this command in five of the 33 miracles that we're going to study inside this class. In five of those miracles, Jesus said, don't talk about this. Don't tell anyone. Keep quiet. He told that to the leper. He told that to the deaf mute. He told that to the blind man. The one, the, those that saw the raising of Jairus' daughter, and then these two men. Why? That's what I want to know is why. Why did he do it? Keep quiet about a miracle. But normally when we see a miracle in our life, it takes, I mean, it takes the holding back straps for us to keep quiet about it. That's the way I am. Man, the Lord did this, and I want everybody to know what my God is capable of. 
I can't do it, but he showed up, and he showed up right on time, and he did what no man can do. I want to tell people about the miracles. I do. I want people to know that God's not dead, that he's still on the throne, and that he's still in the miracle-working business. So why keep quiet? Why the command to keep quiet? Look at the declaration of this restriction. The Bible says that he straightly charged them in verse number 30. Straightly charged them. That doesn't just mean that he told them. That's a stern command. It's don't tell anyone. It has emotion behind it in the Greek. In other words, he didn't just say, now keep quiet about this. Don't tell anyone. He straightly charged them to tell no man about it. He put some extra force behind it. He was stern in his command. This sternness in his command refutes the idea that we should go easy on new converts when it comes to living a strict biblical life. That we should not be so strong in teaching them biblical convictions and having biblical attitudes. We should tell the preachers not to preach too hard on right living because they'll drive away the new converts. But here we have the Lord Jesus Christ being very stern in his command. I believe that new converts need to know very quickly God's holy standards. New church members need to know where the church takes a strong biblical stand and why, and specifically where those stands are taken, not caring what any other church does, but wanting to stand against truth and error. And I have learned in 14 years of pastoring that good people will embrace God's holy standards. They won't repudiate them. So give them to them early. Let them know real early that we, we, we're against adultery, stepping outside of your marriage. Let them know real early that the Bible says that homosexuality is wicked and evil and sinful. Don't pull any punches that, that God created two genders, male and female. Don't tiptoe around the tulips, come straight at it and say, no, no, he didn't. Male and female and anything opposite of that is wicked and filthy. Let's not be quiet about the fact that we are against pornography in all of its forms and fornication. No, no. Let's put it right out there on the marquee. Let's straightly charge them. They can't have God's blessing without it. You say, prove it. Look at the people who do all that stuff. I don't want the monkey pox. And everybody in this room with their head out of the sand knows where it comes from. And you can avoid it. I'm not saying someone couldn't get it otherwise. But you can, you, can, you can really cut your chances down of getting the monkeypox by living the way the Bible says to. Amen. We're not going to hide that from new Christians. Okay? Let's pray and we'll have about 14 minutes before the morning service begins. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the miracles we can study in your word. We thank you for our miracle working Savior who could even open the eyes of the blind. What power. And Lord, I pray that we would not reduce in our hearts the same power to work in our lives, to work in our circumstance, to work in our situation. Help us, Lord, to have our spiritual blindness set aside as we read your word. We want to understand it. We want to see it. And I pray that you would do that for us. Lord, if there's someone here today with, without Christ, without salvation, without the born-again experience, Lord, I know you can work today as you've worked before. And I pray that you would. I pray that, that it'd be easy for a lost sinner to come forward today and receive Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed for about 14 minutes. Thank you for viewing our live stream service today. 
We want to let you know that our service doesn't end with the conclusion of today's message. If you ever need anything from Cornerstone Baptist Church, if you need spiritual direction, if you need to more fully understand the doctrine of salvation, if you need uh, a listening ear, we want to let you know that we're here. We hope that you'll personally come and visit our services.